Hello everybody and good morning. Uh, my name's Harriet Dunn and to, joining me shortly will be uh, Luke and uh, Stefano. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to have a look at uh, what we've named really the business survival kit and how to work with a partner when the world has gone crazy. Now, as a lot of you know, this was actually going to be a live event that HI Commercial were going to do at their, their building. But obviously with everything that's happened that had to be cancelled. So what we've done is we've got together and we thought, well, let's, we've all got to keep working. So let's do get on and do something. So we changed the subject slightly and we thought, well, right now, um, also a lot of us are locked in the home uh, with our families, but it also means we've got a lot of worries, sorry, about our businesses. So we went with this topic. So what I am going to do now, if that's okay, uh, before uh, before we begin, um, a lot of you won't be used to go to webinar. So a couple of things. First of all, it's not like Zoom. Don't worry, we can't see you, we can't hear you. So uh, you can relax and eat your wheat a bit if that's what you want to do. Um, on your screen, you have should have a go to webinar control panel. I'd just like you to look at that for a minute. Can you see there's a box that says questions? If you're looking on your mobile phones, it will literally be a question mark. What I want to make sure is during this webinar that you can see us and that you can hear us. So I'd really appreciate it if you could just type in the question box that, yes, we can hear you, uh, slow down, you're talking too quickly, or just so that I know and that we know during this webinar that you can actually hear us and see us. So I'm just gonna pause through, brilliant. So we've got a yes, we can hear you. Great, all coming in. I'll just give it a little bit longer. I will check in with you during the webinar to make sure you can, but if any time there's a problem, just type in there and we can all see it. That's great. Oh, fantastic. Oh yes, we're all coming in. Recognize some names. Hello everybody. The other thing is, although this is a webinar, so it's not like Zoom where we're all on uh, mics, you absolutely want your questions. Your questions are important to us. So at any time during the webinar, you have a question, just type it in that box. And then at the end, we're going to do a question and answer section. OK, so sit back, enjoy, drink your coffee, as I say, or eat your, eat your Weetabix, whatever you're doing right now. A good excuse to shut the door and tell the children and uh, everybody else they can't come in. Um, all right, now obviously I do have to say uh, this is more of a seminar sort of uh, webinar type training type thing giving you a bit of uh, content so obviously please remember you do need to take professional advice before you put any of this into action. So who have you got today? Okay, so joining me very shortly will be Luke, he's the commercial director at HI Commercial and he'll be coming on in a few seconds. Stefano is also coming in shortly and he will introduce himself. So I'll just tell you very briefly a little bit about myself. Um, as you can see there, I run a business called Build Your Business Training. I'm a business coach and consultant. I was in fact a commercial solicitor for, near, well, for nearly 25 years. Um, I sold that business well, several years ago now and I was very fortunate enough to go traveling. Lived in Bangkok for a while, lived in San Diego for a while, uh, traveled around Australia and the Southeast Asia, fantastic. And now my business is as a coach and consultant, both internationally and in the UK. So that's, uh, I think, enough about me for now. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to pass you on to uh, Luke just to have a little chat. So I don't know if you want to put your video on, Luke, so uh, everyone can see you. There we go. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Harriet. Uh, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us this morning and, and being part of this webinar. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't all meet together as planned in our office, but we will be putting on future events, uh, so you can all be part of that with us as well. Um, I'd really like to thank Harriet from Build Your Business and Stefano from Cobalt Law for being part of this uh, and coming on board and speaking to us all and providing some really good content today. Um, a bit about our business, for those of you who don't know HR Commercial, we're a commercial insurance broker based in Hull. Uh, were previously the business team of Head and Insurance and following some really positive organic growth over the last few years, uh, we decided to set up on our own as HI Commercial Insurance Services last year. Uh, still in the first year of trading, uh, it's going really well, some really positive news um, and we're really enjoying it. The team's growing, we're in our new offices and everything's heading in the right direction. 
Uh, we set up with a core focus to provide effective insurance solutions, creating the right insurance program, providing the right covers for the right types of clients. Um, and with that core focus, uh, we deliver that day in, day out, which we're really proud of. Uh, our key areas of focus uh, engineering and metal workers, manufacturers, wholesalers, contractors, transportation, and property owners. They're our key markets where we really come into our own. We get some really competitive rates and great coverage. Um, that's enough about HR Commercial. As Harriet said, we are available for questions afterwards if anybody has any queries. Um, so I'll pass back over to Harriet for the next stage of the presentation. Right, thank you very much. Uh, right, just checking, right, okay then. So what are we gonna to cover today? What we're gonna talk about today is working with your business partners really, about why it's good to talk, how to avoid a conflict that might lead to, I've called it a divorce because the fallout of a business relationship, a business failing, you know, by the time you split the assets and all the rest of it, it often is as emotionally distressing, um, you know, so that's why we kind of called it a divorce. We're also gonna talk about what you can do today um, an action plan during lockdown because you can take advantage of this inactivity. Now I'm saying inactivity, I'm very aware of the fact that some of us are still going to work, we're still working, but we still have time to pause for a minute. And you have got time now to do some groundwork so you can head off potential conflicts, address any now before they lead to the business. Because by doing this, you're protecting you, your family, uh, especially you know during these challenging times. Um, so what can go wrong and why do things go wrong? Now, for some of you, the next slide might seem a bit strange, but hopefully the logic behind it will make sense. You're in this business and you're running your business, or maybe you're thinking about starting a new business, or maybe you think about taking on a new business partner. And what you need to actually think about first is actually a question for you. And that's what you can do now while you're out doing your one allotted exercise that we're allowed today. You need to think about why are you running this business? I mean, really think about it. So bear with me, those of you who are thinking, oh, I don't like fluffy stuff, think about this. What are your goals? Now, this must be a combination of your life goals and your business goals. And the logic behind this is if you don't know what you want, in, how, can you, how can your business actually deliver that for you? So let's give me some examples. Have you actually asked, so yeah, so if we look to the left here of the, of this, of the screen, oh, apologies, not quite sure why that happened. One second, there we go. If you look to the left here of your screen, um, have you actually thought about um, what do you want from the business? Have you actually asked your business partners what are their life goals? Because if you haven't, then what if their vision of the business is not yours? right from day one. So here's a simple example of what I'm talking about. Do you really want to work part time? Is that actually what you want to be doing? Or actually is it the reverse? No, absolutely not. I want to work 24 seven solidly for five years, build a very nice big business, thank you very much. And I want to be able, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, and I want to be able to sell it for a very nice bit of money, thank you and walk away. Another example is actually do you, from this business you're running, you might run several businesses, do you actually want to be earning £2,000 per month? And that's actually okay. Or actually is your target £5,000 per month? Or is your target actually £20,000 a month? Now I don't mean in turnover, I mean in your own pocket. Now you can see that those business models are very different. Your systems are different, your procedures are different. So you need to be thinking about what do you want? And um, are you thinking about actually one day you'd like to retire, sell some of your shares, just get rid of it, walk away? Maybe your business is actually your baby. And whatever happened, it's yours forever. You're never leaving it. You always want an interest in it. So again, that's going to affect what's your exit strategy. Are you going to franchise? Are you going to retain it? Do you want to keep an income so you can go traveling? So what is your vision? So all of these things you need to think about and they're very personal to you. You can talk to them with your life partner maybe, unless of course you don't really want your life partner at the moment in that, but that's not a discussion for today. So what you're doing here is you're thinking, what do I actually want? Why am I actually running this business? 
Okay. So once you've done that and you thought, why am I running this business? What's it for me? We're going to go on to some different steps. So what can go wrong then in a business in good times and in bad? Okay. Well, when you started your business or you took on your partners, maybe you moved premises, you looked at your finances, you will have negotiated with your suppliers, you will have created your marketing plan. You may even have a business plan somewhere in a drawer. But one of the unseen threats to your business is the relationship between the business partners. And a sound business can fail simply due to a breakdown between the owners. Now, normally these misunderstandings just need heading off at the pass. Sometimes, though, they are insurmountable and it's time to shake hands and amicably walk away. And when you're not face to face or seeing each other daily, resentment can build and misunderstandings over, over often understandings about what you're perceiving the other person's actually doing. Now, you add the external pressure of COVID-19 to your business and your health. At this minute, you've actually got a bit of a, a bit of a double whammy. I'm having fun with my clicker here. Oh. All right. If you bear with me. All right. Now, it's absolutely normal in any relationship, whether it's business or personal, to have irritations and annoyances. That is completely normal. Don't worry about that. All right. But when it comes to your business, these are often rooted in simple misunderstandings. And it's often over some aspect of the why you're in the business, which goes back to why I was talking about the brainstorming, because why you're in this business might not be why your business partners in this business. It also go back to the expectations of the owners, which have not been openly discussed. Now, some of the many common complaints we come across between business owners. So these are just some examples are money. Who has access to the business credit cards is a good example when you look at the credit card and who's paid for something. Perceived effort in the business, well, I'm doing more than them. Uh, risk, risk an interesting one. Different views of risk when it comes to taking on debt, taking on new premises, taking on new employees, maybe going for a big contract. People have different views of risk. Personality clashes, very often, businesses are successful because you do have different skills you complement each other but that can lead to personality clashes uh, things we get complaints are often over borrowing the amount of borrowing how big the overdraft is should you take the loan especially now where whether should we take this loan from the government you know it's not a grant it will need repaying another gripe very often is families working in the business somebody else's family member working in the business and another gripe tends to be, as a business grows, it's giving a 24-7 demand on your time. Well, if really when you set this up, you set it up because you actually wanted to work less because that's what you didn't like about your old job, to then be working 24-7 again can lead to just feelings of, you know what, I'm really not enjoying this. So let's look at what we can do to avoid the conflict. And we literally are going to start with a now, this is essential for any new business. It's really not as easy for an existing business. OK, um, now we are going to give you a checklist. You'll see there's a handout section which you can download at the end of the webinar. And that's going to be a bit of a guide to help you with this conversation. But what you're going to do and we're going to go through this now, you need to do a bit of a brainstorm. You need to list your objectives. OK, and this is the objectives with your partner that you're going to want to achieve with your partner list your ideas down these are your ideas we're still it's still what you want at this stage you're then going to talk and you're then going to put that into action so let's do a bit of lane a bit of brainstorming so these questions will help you and again this is about you be clear in your own mind what you would do in different circumstances and you'll think of many more so let's do some what ifs so what if actually your business becomes a million pound business, two, three million pound business. What would you do? Would you sell it or would you keep it? OK, idea two. What if the country you're making a loss? Do you want to borrow some more money and keep going? Do you want to put in some of your personal cash? How much have you got? You know, do you either actually just sell the business if you can find a buyer or just close it? Idea three. If you're going for borrowing, have you thought about would you offer security? Would you give a personal guarantee? Would you offer a secure charge on your home? What, what would you feel comfortable with? So idea four, gets divorced, 
sorry, ex-solicitor, got another solicitor in a minute. But if one of you gets divorced, that is going to have an impact on your business because they could possibly, don't know, check, obviously take advice, claim. What if one of you goes bankrupt? What are your options? Unfortunately, what if one of you know if you pass away, what's the options? Or what if you become incapacitated? I struggle with that word, but anyway. Um, so basically, uh, you're divorced, you've gone bankrupt, I've killed you off, and now you got run over, run over by bus, but you survived. <laughs> well, I'll cheer up in a minute, I promise. So idea six, what if you actually need new premises? Is this a time where you'd actually like to buy some? Or are you going to rent them? And then another one for you to think about, if you and your business partner have different expectations from the business, how are you going to resolve that conflict? So think about that. And this is something you can do yourselves. If you like vision boards, do a vision board. If you like an Excel spreadsheet, do an Excel spreadsheet. Do whatever suits you. Do some great graphics. But you need to think about this. So what are the key objectives? You've, you know, you've thought about why you're in the business, you've done your brainstorming. So what are your key objectives as you go to talk to your business partners? Well, let's minimize some risk for a start because anybody who thinks being self-employed running their own business is easy, it's not. Um, so one of the things you want to do is minimize your risk. And the easiest way to start that is just review your business plan. But remember at its heart should be the personal goals of the business owners because we must avoid the conflict and dispute. You need to set, was one of your objectives of this meeting, is to have clear intentions for the future. What is your goal for the business? So now we're coming away from you now to the business. You know, what's your intention? When do you want to all retire? You know, do you want to sell the business? Do you want to expand? Is that the clear intention of all of you now? You need to set budgetary targets. One of your objects is, so one of the things I said to you on the first slide was, do you want to earn 2,000 a month? Do you want to earn 5,000 a month? Do you want to earn 20,000 a month? So you need some budgetary targets. And also this is your parachute. Because at what point do we walk away from our businesses or our business partner? So think about what's an acceptable debt level. What's your expectation of an income? Your target four is assign your roles, a big one to avoid conflict. Who is responsible for what? Not I thought he was doing it. I thought she was doing it. And particularly be honest about what you don't want to do. And then again, set a clear path for, about any dispute, even however minor. So once you've done that, you can start listing out your ideas. Again, there's a checklist. So your eyes could be, right, OK, for me, uh, I really would like think it'd be good if we ran this business for five years and we sold it because I quite like to go back to Bangkok, really. Um, I'm very happy. I think we should all commit 30 hours per week to this business. And if you want to do something else, I, I'm fine with that. You know, I'm going to run the sales. You can run the admin, et cetera, et cetera. And we agree that we'll withdraw no more than £3,000 per month. That might be on a contract car hire. Um, I might want to put, you know, you can work that out. And then this list becomes your agenda for your conversation with your business. Now, I'm just going to pause for one second. And I just want to check back in with you. If I go to the questions, are you, can you all still hear me? Are the, are the slides okay? Are we doing all right? Because I don't want to have lost any of you. Just any? Yeah, wonderful. Just checking in because I do know with the, the webinar stuff, sometimes we can lose things. That's great. So you've done your brainstorming, you've thought about what you want, you've thought about what you want for the business, you start to write your ideas down, you've got a clear area of what's going to be happening. So just touch on now, now what happens if you do nothing? Now, absolutely, of course, um, you can just go into business, whoever you like, whenever you like, and just get on with it without these conversations, of course you can. And the truth is most people do. But what happens if the business you started looks very different after a few years and it's not turning out like you hoped or wanted? Now, I don't necessarily mean there that um, it's not making money. It could actually be extremely profitable, but you're working so hard, it's just not what you wanted. So what happens then? Well, it's probably unfortunately not what you expect. At that point, if you've never documented what your agreement were or what was, you know, sometimes you, you're just not going to be very happy. So that's me punching a, a monitor because I thought it was funny. Anyway, so you've brainstormed, you've set your objectives, you've created your list, you've had an open conversation with your business partners. Now, at that point, you can actually decide 
you know, if actually you shouldn't be in business together, it's just time to amicably part. That's absolutely acceptable and fine and support each other. But actually, if actually, no, this is good, we want to continue, then we need to get our house in order. So next step. So as anything, prevention is better than a cure. Now, the how you're going to do this is actually going to depend on your business structure. So what I'm going to do at this point, if Stefano, if you can make sure you are ready with your camera and your screen, I am going to hand you over as organiser. Good morning. Can you hear so me? If you give me a moment, guys, I will just turn myself off. And hopefully now I will just hand over. Go for it. Thank you, Harriet. Good morning to everyone. Hopefully you can see me. Uh, I'm Stefano Lucatella, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm a practicing solicitor, born and bred in Hull. Some of you out there know me. We've come uh, up as friends, uh, clients, and uh, my background is that I'm a commercial property and commercial lawyer, uh, now mainly doing international property work. I'm senior partner of a small London uh, niche practice called Cobalt Law. And we help people buy property abroad mainly, so in Italy, France, Spain and Portugal. I'm based in Chelsea and we have a team of lawyers from many, many parts of the world, all specialised in buying property abroad, commercial and residential. But today my job's uh, to talk to you as to what you should be putting into your various forms of agreements that you should have in place when you're working in business with someone else or some more people, could be two, three, four, five of you. So. Uh, my uh, my first point would be to say that you've got three choices. Uh, the most common is the limited liability company. You can be a partnership, a general partnership, uh, or you can be what's called a limited liability partnership. Cobalt Law, how I practice, is a limited liability practice. Uh, and it's uh, a partnership that is mostly for professionals. So you'll find accountants and solicitors mainly use this form of practice. Uh, and I'm going to turn myself off, uh, I think, uh, for the moment. Right. I'm not sure if I'm on or I'm off. Yes, I'm off, I think. Um, right. So if you're a company, you will be regulated now by the Companies Act 2006. And as such, that will tell you exactly what you can do and what you can't do uh, as a, um, uh, as a, ooh, we've gone back, as a, as a shareholder and as a director. The three main types of three main types of agreement that you should have in place when you've got a, a company is a shareholders agreement, direct service agreement, and a cross option agreement. Um, those are the three fundamental basic points that you should have uh, the agreements that you should have. The shareholders agreement. The shareholders agreement is an agreement which regulates the terms between shareholders as to what they're going to do, who's going to put what in, how they're going to work what's going to happen in a multitude of circumstances, which we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. The direct to service agreement, that's basically a contract of employment. Now, remember that if you, are, um, if you are a director, you're not necessarily an employee of the company. So you need to have a director's service agreement. Uh, and as such is very, very important because that regulates, ooh, gone again, that regulates the terms of your employment as a director to the company. Uh, and as such, that's very, very important. Thirdly, the cross option agreement, cross option agreement, sometimes called a double option agreement, uh, is an agreement that can be included in the shareholders uh, documentation. Uh, it can be entered into by all the shareholders and it must be, in my view, op uh, operated by all the shareholders. Uh, and a cross option agreement is essentially a, uh, a document which protects the shares of a deceased partner or uh, company director because it applies in both you can have it in uh, in both um, a partnership and also um, a company um, and a cross option agreement deals with the fatality or illness of a of a shareholder uh, and it deals with the transfer of shares once that person dies uh, either to a third party uh, or uh, another purchaser who can be another of the directors within the company uh, and as such is a very very important document you can get cross option agreement insurance and you must one of the insurances we'll talk about in a few minutes time is the uh, is this cross option insurance um as i say if you're governed by the limited liability partnership act of 2000 uh, that deals with professional partnerships for the most part um and if you're in the just a general partnership that's governed by the partnership act 1890 uh and uh, so that's the most ancient form remember guys that 
if you don't have a partnership agreement and you're working together, remember that the definition of a partnership is a relationship that subsists between people carrying on a business in common with a view to profit. I suppose that's also in the limited liability company. But remember that if you don't have a partnership agreement, you will be regulated by the restrictive terms of the 1890 Partnership Act. Very, very restrictive. So this is why it's very important that you should have your own personalized partnership agreement, shareholders agreement, whatever. Personalize it. It's important that you do that. So, uh, and for most organizations, the choice of business vehicle is most likely to be either a company or a partnership. And the right option will be uh, the right option will will be unique to individual circumstances. And it'll depend on a range of factors, including tax and legal requirements. Uh, and you must identify the pros and cons right at the very beginning. Um, and it, it sometimes it comes down to a straight option of convenience. Limited companies more complex than a than a partnership, uh, and shareholders and directors and partners have different rights and obligations. Um, and we'll talk about why you should choose one against the other. So. Remember that uh, it's important to choose. Don't go into business with someone and then decide five years later that you decide to have an agreement because by then it'll be too late because something will happen and you'll end up, uh, as in uh, Harriet used to do in her previous life and me now, you'll end up in my office and I'll be sat there trying to arbitrate between two people who are not very happy. So that's not where we want to be. So let's move on to the next slide. And I've identified six important positions. Um, why you should be a partnership or a limited company and dependent on what decision you make will take you down one path or the other. So the first thing I've decided to talk about is minimizing personal liability. And what I'd say is that the biggest benefit of forming your own company is limited liability protection. That's the main reason. Simply put, should your company run into trouble, your personal assets are secure. A limited company is treated as a separate legal entity as a separate legal person in its own right. It, a partnership is not. Therefore, the business is entirely separate from the people who own it and manage it. The separation is known as the corporate veil. And sometimes you lose this corporate veil. Which Stefano, is corporate... Stefano, my dear, your slide hasn't changed. Really sorry to interrupt. Thank you. So why hasn't it changed? Right. Has it changed? Are you there, Harriet? Uh, no. Where are you now? Or what slide are you on? Uh, next step, let's sort it out. Why isn't it? Uh, I've lost my control bar, Harriet. Right, That's two seconds. Thing. You keep talking and I will take control of the screen. No worries, that you just keep that. talking. Yeah. Um, ooh, where are we going? So, minimize the point about setting up a limited company is that you minimize personal responsibility. Um, and as a shareholder, you'll have no legal obligation to pay any more than the value of the shares. Uh, and usually when you set up a limited liability company, people who contribute as shareholders don't actually pay their one pound, two pounds. So when the company and if the company goes into liquidation, the only amount that a liquidator can ask from you is the unpaid share capital. This could be as little as a, as a pound. The rare instances in which the corporate veil might be lifted or pierced, uh, and so separation can be disregarded, is where, of course, directors foolishly enter into personal guarantees with banks that's where a bank and maybe a business is very young it's a limited company it's very young uh, and a bank will only lend you if the directors give personal guarantees i was always taught i used to work at williamson's in hull many years ago and my senior partner john bullock used to say to me the, the definition of a guarantor a personal guarantor is a fool with a pen so ladies and gentlemen, try and avoid giving personal guarantees because you will be liable to the very nth degree of your assets. Uh, and it could very well be that you lose your matrimonial home and anything else. So be careful if you are giving a personal guarantee, if you shouldn't be, but if you have to, uh, make sure it's limited. Uh, and and let's, uh, let's talk about the next point, which is uh, professional, uh, where are we going? Where are we going? It's uh, tax efficiency and planning. So, it's advantageous to set up a limited company. Why? Because limited companies currently pay 19% corporation tax on profits as opposed to 20 to 45 and if more income tax. And reinvesting surplus cash rather than withdrawing all available profits each year and paying more personal tax on top of your corporation tax liability, you can retain surplus income in the business to pay for future operational costs and growth. This makes more sense than withdrawing all the profits, paying income tax, and reinvesting your own finances when the business needs additional capital. 
you can also defer personal income. You can defer withdrawal of profits to a later tax year in which a lower rate of business or personal tax is due. So this is quite an efficient tax strategy if the withdrawal of all available profits would take you into a higher tax income bracket or a higher dividend income tax bracket. So you can choose as a director of a company how you take your remuneration. Do you take it as a salary or do you take it as dividend? It's very tax efficient to take a dividend. But remember, you can only take a dividend if the company has profits which are available for distribution. You cannot take a dividend if there are no such uh, profits available for distribution. Uh, third point, separate legal entity. We've talked, touched about that. So unlike a partnership, a limited company is a separate legal person. And as a result, companies can enter into contracts in their own name. Remember, it's not Stefano Lucatello, but it's Stefano Lucatello Limited separate legal entity, and it has its own responsibilities and contractual obligations, responsibilities for debts and liabilities. The owners are only liable for the value of their unpaid shares, as I said, uh, and remember that there can be another piercing of the corporate veil, I've mentioned before that if you gave a personal guarantee, remember that if you trade under insolvent conditions, that means that your company is wrongfully trading, it's insolvent, then the directors of the company may become liable for the debts of the company. That's one of the other situations that you can be liable for the debts of the company, even though you have a separate legal entity. So be careful. If you are at the stage where you feel that you are trading insolvent and the accounts show you that you are, go to your accountant, make sure that things are right. If they're not, then you should go to a, an insolvency practitioner, take advice and assistance. Remember, today is only a training session. Whatever we say, Harry and I say, you must follow it up with proper legal advice. Uh, the fourth point is public disclosure and privacy. Many people, especially in their early years, set up a partnership. Why? Because they are private. Their information is not public. It doesn't attract attention. Remember that if you uh, have a company, then there is a lot of information which is out there. You can go to a company's house and do your searches. You can find out if I'm a director, if I'm a secretary, if I'm a shareholder, uh, if there is a mortgage registered against the company, and all sorts of other matters which are public information. Very, very important that you know that. Fifthly, investment and lending. Uh, investment and lending is, is very, very important. So does the company borrow? Do you borrow and then you make a loan as a director to the company? It has different tax, tax uh, realizations. So you must take accountancy advice on all this sort of thing. So if companies have multiple owners, it's possible to raise additional capital by selling shares and getting new investors in. Uh, and generally companies have more lending opportunities than sole traders and partnerships. Although having said that nowadays partnerships, especially limited liability partnerships as we trade, uh, offer you the, the, the ability to go to a bank and borrow on the same terms as a limited liability company. And certain banks, it's true to say, will only lend to incorporated businesses. And sixthly, Pensions. Companies can provide uh, the opportunity to invest pre-tax trading income in a company pension scheme as opposed to investing withdrawn income. So that's important. Uh, and you must look at your pensions, whether you're trading in a partnership or a company, decide what's going to happen and decide when it's going to happen. As is Harriet said, you may be trading in a company with a limited period of time. You may decide that after 10 years, you're going to sell up and decide both of you to go off. So... Harriet, hopefully you can still hear me. I'm going to move to the, can you see me now? Is that, is that moving, Harriet, to the next slide? Can you hear me? Are you there? Yes, all good. On the next slide. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. So now we actually turn to the content, some of the most important contents of the agreement. And remember that when you come and see me as a solicitor, I haven't got a panacea for everything. I need to listen. I need to be in active listening mode. And you are the people who are important. And you are the people who dictate what will go into that agreement. It's very important. It doesn't matter whether it's basic English or what. I need to know from you what you want, because what I say to you may not be applicable. You may have a particular type of partnership for which a certain number of clauses that I would put into an agreement may not apply. So. There's no particular order to what I'm going to talk to you about next, but I thought we'd start with a negative, which is disputes. I always say to clients, when you come and see me, I'm happy to see you. I'd rather you come and see me now because you are the best of friends when you go into business together. But in six months time, a year, something might have happened to turn everything around and you might not like each other. 
you might come back to me in a year's time and say, Stefano, we've fallen out, whatever reason. And I'm saying, where's the agreement that regulates the terms between you? And if you do not have a document which regulates the disputes and how disputes are going to be regulated, you will have a problem. So what happens in deadlock? Many, many of the shares, uh, shareholders in the company own shares 50-50. That's a problem. I was always taught that when you have shareholders in, an, in a company or partners, if that matter, you should always have an odd number of partners or directors in a company. Why? Because you then can have the possibility of having two against one and it will avoid deadlock. What's going to happen if you do have deadlock? Is there a provision in the agreement which says that one of you will buy the other out? Uh, is there a Russian roulette clause, as we call it, uh, that will trigger a series of events off? Um, what's going to happen? If is deadlock going to mean that you close the company down and sell the shares off to a third party, you put the company up for sale, what are you going to do? So you must regulate how disputes will be dealt with, because if you don't, it will be a sure thing that something will happen and you will end up arguing. And then not only will you two suffer, three of you suffer, whatever, but the business will suffer in this period as well. So that's most important. That leads me on to sale. So what happens if someone comes along and says, you've done really well, I want to take you over, I want to buy you out because you're a brilliant company, I want to absorb you into a bigger entity, whatever. You must consider that. What's the plan for exit on that? Have you got a limited period, as I mentioned before, that you're gonna to practice together with five or 10 years? Maybe one of these older than the other. My partner in my business is 20 years younger than me. So I've got expectations in life, which are totally different from David's, my business partner, as I say, who is 20 years younger than me. So will he buy me out? Will I sell my shares to some third party? Whatever. We need to consider all these bits and pieces. Are you going to sell in an ideal world a partner or a director will make sure that his shares will go to the in, in, certainly in the first instance they'll go to the other partner or that the other directors have the choice of buying him out or her out so that's important so consider that what happens with death well there's only two things in life which are certain uh, one is death and the other is that the taxman will take his penny if he has the uh, the opportunity so you must consider what happens if a partner dies, if a director dies, would their family inherit their share of the business? Uh, would the other partners have the option to purchase instead? Or would you rather just wind the business up and all partners and directors just sell the business? This goes back to the cross option agreement that I talked about beforehand, because in many cases, the deceased shares, a deceased partner's shares or the deceased partner, a deceased director's shares, sorry, um, will then come up for distribution and the family of the deceased will want something to, to be done with them to realize uh, capital. Profit shares. How are you going to decide what, uh, what profit shares are going to be taken? Who's going to take what profits, what dividends in a company? How are you going to be uh, paid? What are you going to take? As I said, remember, you can't take dividends unless there are profits to be taken out. Um, are you going to have equal ownership? I mean, that's fundamental. You know. What am I bringing to the table? What are you bringing to the table? Do I bring more than you? So that should be reflected in the shareholding I have. Remember, if possible, do not have 50-50 shareholdings for all sorts of reasons. It stops uh, uh, um, decisions being made. Uh, ordinary resolutions can be made 50% plus one. Remember, if you have a, um, an, extraordinary general, an extraordinary resolution or special resolution, it's 75% plus one. So that also needs to be considered. Okay, let's go to the next one. Borrowing. How are you going to borrow? How is the business going to borrow? What level are you going to be happy with? Who is going to have the, the ability to go to a bank and decide what's going to be borrowed by the business? Are you going to have any input into what's said? I think both partners, both directors, if they're directors of the company, partners of, of a partnership, must have equal input. Because at the end of the day, especially in the partnership, uh, both of you are going to be joint and severally liable. Remember that in a partnership, except for a limited liability partnership, you will be jointly and severally liable for the whole of the debts of the business. Whereas in a company, as I said before, you're only liable for the shareholding that you're unpaid on your shares. Banking. Who are you going to bank with? What sort of limits are you going to have? Are you going to have, a, are you going to have a, an overdraft facility? Uh, and who's going to agree that overdraft facility? Usually, in a business, there will be someone who brings knowledge to the table and the other person will be the administrator and brings other uh, benefits to the table. So you'll have clearly delineated decision making roles within the business. So decide that I'm going to do this, you're going to do this. And the other thing, guys, is talk. Many of you will have small businesses where you have one room as your office. So 
you don't have to formally have a shareholders or a directors meeting just talk across the table to each other don't send each other emails talk to each other take an hour out go and have a walk and talk about things it can be as informal as that taking on a lease or buying do you take a lease or do you buy the building remember that nowadays it's advantageous for the directors to buy um uh, the people to buy the buildings and then enter into sips self-administered pension funds uh, and then maybe the business rents rents the, the property from you so it's a, a double win-win situation because the landlord is one of the directors or both the directors of the company and the company pays a rent to these uh, these directors uh, in return and decision making roles that goes back to what i said before what partnership percentage are you going to own what percentage of the shares in the company you're going to own and who's going to have the final say will one of you act in a director's board meeting as the chairman and have a casting vote these are all important things don't seem important until the matter comes to actual decision making day and you find that either in the articles of association of the company which are the the the, the rules that regulate the company or the shareholders agreement uh, or uh, the partnership agreement they don't actually cover this point so make sure that you have these points covered so who's going to run the business? Are you all going to be active in the business or is one of you going to be a silent partner because you've just put money into the business? And what's going to happen if you trade insolvent? What are the obligations? Who's going to be liable for what? Fortunately, well, hopefully you will never get to that position. But I mean, remember that you can wind a company up for all different reasons, whether it's uh, voluntarily because you've come to the end of the trading relationship or because a creditor winds you up or by court, by court. So be careful and make sure that you don't trade insolvent because it can pierce the corporate veil in a company and you will be liable personally. So is the company set up for a particular period of time and who's gonna do what during that period of time and what's gonna happen at the end? Who's going to buy the business? How are you gonna sell it? How are you gonna get rid of it? Holidays, these are daft things, but you know, partners never think and directors never think about are you going to work full-time, part-time? Are you going to take holidays? One of you may be older, like I am in my business, and I want to take more holidays than my partner. Um, so you have these things written down. It's important. Uh, working in the business, you might have interests in, some of you listening might have interests or hands in many, uh, pot, uh, hands in many, many different pots and pies. So how much time are you going to dedicate to one business? Will it be allowed for you to work in more than one business? These things must be taken into account. And when one of you leaves the business say for example you're a junior partner you've learned everything you need to know about the business and decide you go off on your own you want to wing it yourself there must be restrictive covenants and restrictive covenants harriet and i know from practicing that these are very very important trading when you leave can you trade in competition to the business is there going to be a restrictive covenant about not taking clients or taking employees and such restrictions must always be reasonable in time and in distance there have been so many court cases where people have lost because the, their expectations were not reasonable, either in time or in distance. Insurances, well, this is all about HI insurance and they'll tell you more, Luke and his team will tell you more about directors insurance, liability, liability insurance, professional indemnity insurance. We as solicitors have professional indemnity insurance. Solicitors, we trade as a limited liability partnership, so we may have to have three million pounds worth of indemnity insurance. Uh, cyber liability insurance, this is something that's come across now in the last four or five years only um, to protect you uh, against uh, uh, people taking, hacking you, your system and, and breaking into your system. Commercial insurance, talk to, to Luke and his team again on that, property insurance. Uh, and just one, uh, one other thing is cross-option uh, cross agreement uh, insurance, uh, which is key man insurance and that sort of thing. So take that out and speak to them. Liabilities, how will these be paid off? Well, in a partnership, it's joint and several liability, except in the case of a limited liability partnership. In a company, as I said, the shareholders only owe what they haven't paid on the capital, uh, on the share, unless, of course, the corporate veil is broken or pierced. And the last thing is valuation of a business. How do you value a business? Well, <laughs> it's a nightmare. When you try and value a business, especially a private business, a limited company, it, because it's not on um, on the stock exchange, it's difficult to value the shares of a business. And there are different ways of uh, valuing a business. So uh, you make sure that you either have an agreed value for the shares, which will stay fixed, not always the best, um, or that uh, an individual third party will be appointed to value the shares of the business, uh, or 
is it an open market value? So those are the important issues that you need to consider when uh, you enter into a business agreement with somebody else and you set up a company. Guys, as a word of warning, do not leave this to the end and do not find yourselves in front of me or Harriet or me as solicitors saying that you've got a problem because then it's going to be more grief and the only person that will win will be neither of you but will be the solicitor because we will charge you hefty fees and it's usually five or ten times more expensive to sort something out rather than if you come to us at the beginning before you set the business and said look this is what we want to do this is how we want to work can you put us together an agreement and safeguard our interests and remember these things are not set in stone you can change these as the business progresses you can change the terms of the agreement of course with mutual consent so i think i've done my bit harriet um over to yeah, you that, yeah that's fantastic thank you thank you so much for that um obviously we're coming towards the end now there's a few more bits i'd like to go through with you but if you want to start typing any questions in the box please please do so what i'd like to talk about now is your action plan during lockdown we're going to start with that so spend time doing this it's something that we never have time to do normally it's quite unique circumstances so just take some time start with deciding what you want to do over the next five years your vision for the business that's personal just to you okay just sit and think quietly about what you want then start to identify where you can see potential conflict or uncertainty with your business partners see where actually so uh stefano kindly said there that his business partner is, is 20 years younger and that in his mind he's he you know that looks like his exit strategy but if his business partner is actually thinking oh i'm off next year you can see that might head to some conflict now write these down now if you're not somebody who doesn't like writing things down you can make a mental checklist but you need to also think how you can create a win-win from that what, what how can you what can you offer to your business partner to offset the fact maybe that they're not going to like what you want or that might not be an issue then meet do it virtually um if, if if you can't see each other right now but i think most of us probably can uh, and start that conversation so how are you going to do it so how are we going to do it um if you're a partnership just have a think about whether you might want to incorporate to be minimize your liability but i just emphasize please take professional advice first if you're a partnership you're going to have a look at doing a partnership agreement now to start with the easiest way to think about that is a nice a4 sheet of paper and start writing it down okay you can download and read the working together checklist that you will able to be able to see in the handout section of this webinar and that's also got our contact details for all three of us if you want a follow-up call um, if you're a company, start looking at doing shareholders agreement, maybe a direct to service contract or review any existing contracts. And again, obviously, start looking about what insurance is to take out to protect your liability in your business. Just, just start to do that. Honestly, how can I, I just want to emphasize the fact that for both of myself and Stefano, we don't like it. I mean, I'm not a solicitor anymore, but for us, when a business came that was successful, had nothing wrong with it, but actually it failed due to a breakdown in relationship or something like that. It, it you know, it's something that's, it's, you know, it, it's sad really. So how often do you need to revisit this? Um, so I would say a monthly business review, so not necessarily about conflict, just a monthly business review is a great opportunity to stay on the same page as your business partner. But what I am going to suggest you do is you put in your diary a three monthly meeting. Now, this is slightly different. This needs to be away from work. Uh, this needs to be in a coffee shop or have a meal and actually talk through any grumbles. But also, can you celebrate your successes? Because we are not very good at celebrating our successes. And sometimes we focus so much about what's going wrong. We don't realize what we've actually achieved. And it's hard to do that in the office where you're working or you know especially if you're trades and you're out and about all day just spend some time together to do that i think lockdown has highlighted for all of us the need for a business continuity plan it, it all right it's been covid it could have been the flooding like in the floods 2007 your building could have burnt down um you know all your employees could go up ill have a look at having that business continuity plan we've all neglected it really and my suggestion is run this six month pandemic test and see what you would do. Um, you also need to obviously have your annual business plan. 
But when you go to do your annual business plan, why don't you approach it differently? Why don't you before it individually do your brainstorm, list your own objectives, list your ideas, then talk and then put it into action. So that's some thoughts for you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm sure some of you've got some questions. Um, if uh, Luke and if you both want to bring your um, cameras back on and unmute yourselves, I'll see what questions come up and I will read them out and then we can just go through those. Please ask us anything at all you want. Um, probably not when you're going to stop talking because as you can see we're quite good at talking. Um, so I just need to unmute you Stefano. Right let's have a look we've got some questions coming in. Have we got any questions? All right I'll start with one. Have you enjoyed it? Has it helped? Have you got some thoughts that you're going to be doing in this next week or so? The awkward bit while I wait to see if anybody types anything in. Oh, okay. Coming just from um, my point of view while the questions are coming in, um, yes. the business continuity plan is such a big, big thing. Um, I know as us as a new startup last year, we were doing all our compliance and part of that was a business continuity plan. And at the time we were sat there thinking, well, nothing's ever going to happen. We've traded absolutely perfectly fine as a head of the insurance business team. Nothing's happened. We're an office risk. It's straightforward. And then this happened. And it really opens your eyes and we're looking back and we're thinking thank goodness we did that review thank god we we did them plans and put everything in place so when it did happen we had to close we had to work remotely we had all the steps in place we knew exactly what we we're going to do um and it is just so important i know it doesn't seem important at the time when you're doing it but when something really does go wrong like the situation we're in now it makes life so much easier to be prepared no, absolutely. I agree completely. And we've had a question that's come in. It says, how do you value a business typically? Now, I think really you're probably asking the wrong people with from our backgrounds. However, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my opinion. I think it comes back to the first question I said about what do you want from this business? Because when it comes to the value of a business, if that business is 100% really you, if it's actually really you with some premises and some clients, that's a lot harder to value. Because if you walk away from the business, your customers and your clients would also um, walk probably. Actually, if you can set your business up in a way, so although you're the face of it, actually you've got the systems in place, um, it's suitable for franchising maybe, it, the, pe the they stay because of what you sell, how you add value to their business, to their lives, what you sell, then it's easier to value the business because it's not related to you. It's then going to be looking at the bricks and mortar you may own and then you know people will tell you it's three or four times turnover but maybe the harsh answer is it's what someone's willing to prepare but i don't know if Stefan, if you'd like to also give your opinion on how do you think well, a value business is typically valued there are three ways of valuing business the open market value the fixed value and a fair market value but it also depends what sort of business you're in you know traditionally lawyers have been three times accountants being three or four times the business uh turnover but it depends what sort of business you're in as you say it could be a one-man band that's incorporated so it's very difficult to actually value and it's what someone is willing to pay at the end of the day remember that business owners think that their business is worth much more than they really are and they have expectations which are much higher than they should be uh, because why because they have an overinflated view of themselves their business and who they are whatever and it could very well be that when the business when you disappear when you go into to, to pension as it were your business disappears with you because there's nothing to sell so and goodwill nowadays as you and i know um harriet goodwill nowadays is very little has very little value if any and in the good old days when you had to buy yourself into a partnership you know we were buying goodwill weren't we when we were entering into as young partners we were entering to uh, law firms as equity partners so Ask an expert. There are experts out there who can value and give you tips. Uh, there are loads of books on the market as to how to value private company shares. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it very much depends on who you are, what sort of business you are, and how long you've been trading. If you've got an exceptional reputation, whether you've cornered the niche, and someone might come along and say, right, we want to absorb you because you've got talents that we don't have. But you'll fit nicely into our exercise. And then it's a question of negotiation. Put your negotiating hat on and get the best price possible. Right. 
Excellent. OK, then. So shall I pass back over to um, to you, Luke? Oh, I should have just said, if you would like a PDF copy of these slides, if you just email me, I've got my uh, email information there. And it's also on the handout and there's a HI commercial handout there. But what I'll do now, I will just hand you back to uh, Luke to, um, to, to, to close, really. Thank you, Harry. Um, I just want to thank you all for attending this morning. Um, I hope you've seen the value and found it worthwhile. I know there's a uh, point in there that I've certainly taken on board myself, uh, which we need to consider. Um, the main point being prevention is better than cure. So um, getting your insurances in place, getting your agreements in place, um, getting, the, getting your plans in place as well, it all needs doing. Uh, up front, so you work to a structure, because like Stefano so, said, um, it can cost five, ta five, ten times as much later down the line trying to cure the issue rather than if you prevented it um, and set the agreements in place in the beginning. That's definitely something to take away. Uh, and from our point of view as HR Commercial, we want to be your trusted advisors. We want to be able to offer you more services uh, beyond the scope of general insurance and this is why um, we'll continue to do events like this uh, with strategic strategic partners that, that can add that value and provide the education. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we will be doing some more in the future so look out for those and if you have any questions after the event, uh, our contact details are below. But thank you very much. Have a good day.